torture, murder. A drug cartel will do anything to protect their business, no matter who's caught in the crossfire. The FBI and NYPD work together to fight back, risking their own lives by going undercover to unlock the secrets of deadly drug gangs, to bring them down from the inside. When the streets of New York flooded with crack cocaine in the 1980s, a wave of violence threatened to drown the city. Colombian cartels brought the coke in and ran their operations with an iron fist. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents somehow had to infiltrate a complex crime ring, protected by a code of silence. Going head to head with killers, any misstep would be fatal. Crack cocaine, cheap, easy to make, and highly addictive. When it hits the streets, violent crime follows. Most of the bloodshed occurs at the street level, among users and dealers. But innocent people suffer too. NYPD detective Richard Eppolito worked narcotics. This one gentleman that owned a uh, Chinese restaurant came out one night and there was a couple of uh, individuals involved in drugs and they'll do anything they can to do to get their next fix. Well, this particular gentleman had gold teeth and they thought nothing to kill him. They just shot him dead and while he's down on the ground, they pull out their switchblades and they start prying his teeth down. In New York, the crack epidemic began in the late 80s NYPD Lieutenant Mike Garrity. It was an extremely violent time. You had turf wars. You had people who just controlled a certain corner. If you set up to make a sale on that corner, there'd be a drive-by shooting. We were losing our youth. We were losing innocent bystanders to drive-bys. Every one of the index crimes went up. It was out of control back then. But arresting users and dealers individually does little to slow the onslaught. You know, it's never ending. Uh, it's just a constant flow. For every one or two guys you take down, there's others to replace them. The only way to stem the flow of narcotics is to find the organizations that import the drugs and dismantle them. To do this, the Department of Justice creates the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. Known as C-13, the task force is made up of NYPD detectives and FBI agents. They know exactly who they're up against, according to Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. In New York in the early 90s, uh, the, the situation was that uh, you had Colombians uh, in control of the drug trade. The two main drug gangs are Colombia's Medellin and Cali cartels. When the cartels ship drugs into the country, they smuggle them in by packing them among valid cargo, according to U.S. Customs Special Agent Phil Spinelli. With containerized cargo, you can conceal the narcotics in just about any type of cargo that you ship into the United States. They've liquefied narcotics and tried to put it into bottles. They've uh, uh, disguised it uh, as dominoes. They've put it into cans of guava paste and cans of peaches where the peaches were completely sealed. And they ship it in through New York City, one of the busiest ports in the world. In the New York area, we receive approximately 5,000 containers a day. Each of those containers probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 18, 20, maybe 30,000 pounds of cargo. So it's extremely difficult. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. When the drugs hit New York, they are distributed across the country. The task force is determined to shut off this supply of drugs and break the backs of the cartels. 
Our purpose in uh, the task force was to build cases, uh, try to monitor these individuals, try to infiltrate them, and take them down. To do so, Detective Eppolito immerses himself undercover in the shadowy world of drug traffickers, and he needs help. The most productive cases uh, involve confidential informants because they know what's going on. They're already on the inside. Once the detective develops trust with an informant, doors begin to open. I had one particular confidential uh, informant that was uh, extremely reliable. In December 1991, the informant tells Eppolito about a man named Eduardo. He says Eduardo deals in cloned cell phones and might be connected to the Medellin cartel. He knows the Colombian cartels desperately want to do business with the American mafia. They felt uh, traditional organized crime was here a long time. They know all the ins and outs, all the tricks. They have all the contacts. And that's basically what they were looking for. This could be the opportunity Eppolito's been looking for to get inside the cartel. He decides to go undercover, posing as a member of the mafia in an effort to orchestrate a large-scale drug purchase from the cartel. The detective asks the informant to set up a meeting with Eduardo and introduce him as Tony Romano, his undercover identity. The informant goes to Eduardo and tells him about Tony Romano. Eduardo seems interested in a mafia connection and agrees to meet. But he warns the informant, if it's a setup, there'll be hell to pay. Undercover work is among the most dangerous assignments an officer takes up. If he's identified as a cop, he and his informant will likely be killed. Every meeting is scripted, so the undercover knows what to say and what to avoid. An undercover operation is a carefully orchestrated deal. Uh, we just don't send the undercover out there. He doesn't operate in a vacuum. Uh, what we do, we have pre-meets before we go out. We have tech plans. We go over them, things. We try to cover every scenario that possibly could happen. And when we decide to go out, the safety of the undercover is paramount. We have people that are assigned strictly to watch the undercover, provide security for them, to try to control the meat location. You're going to pick a location that you're somewhat familiar with. C-13 decides to have Eppolito meet Eduardo in a local bar. We set up outside, we surveilled you know, them arriving and going in, but we also sent agents and detectives, you know, inside. The key is never appearing too anxious. It was best not to jump right into the drugs, because uh, a lot of times when you do that, they raise up on you, and they think you're the cops or the feds, and they back off. So I figured I'd start off small, start off low, and try to do some cellular fraud uh, business with this guy. Eppolito suggests a deal for cloned cell phones, reprogrammed phones that use an unwitting customer's service for free. He says he needs them for his mob activities. And I also told him that I don't want to jump right into the drug aspect because I don't know who you are. You know, so let's do this, and if we both come out of it okay, you know, we can move on. So a little bit of psychology there. Eduardo agrees to clone the phones for a price. After the meet, Eppolito debriefs the task force. By now, intelligence agents have uncovered more details about the drug dealer. Eduardo was considered like a street dealer or a mule. He, uh, he wasn't well placed within any organization. He's a guy that would uh, broker deals, try to hook you up with somebody, you know, stuff like that. He, he definitely wasn't our main focus in this whole investigation. We wanted to use him as a stepping stone to go higher up or go up the ladder. Claiming he's satisfied with the clone phone deal, Eppolito takes the case to the next level. He sets up another deal with Eduardo. 
this time for drugs. The detective has to maintain his mobster image. You basically have to show credibility. You have to be able to convince the people uh, that you're who you say you are. In doing so, it means you have to walk the walk, talk the talk. Authorities need to play it cool. They don't want to order too much cocaine right away, which could tip Eduardo off. In fact, that's a red flag. So what we decided to do was just order a small amount. So one kilogram of cocaine is what we ordered from Eduardo. Eduardo comes through with a single kilo. A good sign he may be connected to a cartel. Undercover officers follow Eduardo after the deal. They need to determine if the man's really connected to a cartel. Someone who can lead them up the chain of command or just another small-time dealer who cannot help further the investigation. Nobody knows, first of all, if in fact we really do have a narcotic smuggling organization. There seems to be hints of it, there seems to be smoke, and what we're trying to do is see if in fact there is a fire there. Investigators spot a man and a woman who might be associated with Eduardo going in and out of a house. Hopefully authorities can ID the pair later. This sort of meticulous and time-consuming work is required to gather intelligence and build a case against the cartels who operate under a strictly enforced code of silence. The C-13 task force also checks the purity percentage of the cocaine Eduardo sold them. It was extremely high quality. It was in the high 90s, which was like telling you that it's you're basically into the source, which is what we needed. Pure cocaine means no middlemen have cut it down yet. It looks like Eduardo is a good lead into the cartels. At that point, we realized that we had somebody that could possibly take us to the types of individuals of drug traffickers that the task force was geared to target. It's the first milestone in what will be a long and dangerous investigation. In 1991, New York's C-13 task force tries to infiltrate a Colombian drug cartel, beginning with a low-level broker named Eduardo. After one successful cocaine buy, Eduardo asks undercover detective Richard Eppolito to meet the drug dealers Eduardo represents. So he orchestrated a meet with uh, a female individual known as, a uh, street name was Monica. They would never give anybody their real name uh, for fear they would be identified. As with every meet, backup agents cover Epolito. They recognize Monica as the woman seen at the house Eduardo entered after the first buy. When I was introduced to Monica, it just meant stepping up one, one extra step in a ladder. Epolito must constantly maintain the charade. In character is Tony Romano, a member of the Mafia. He explains he has connections in customs and can move shipments through the ports. Agents spot a man watching the meet. They realize he's the other person seen at the house, Special Agent Fernando Llanos. Colombians, as sophisticated as they were, oftentimes would conduct counter surveillance. This was, you know, a standard operating procedure for them. So we were wary of individuals that could be looking out to, you know, for law enforcement. It's a preliminary meeting. No real decisions are made. But Monica appears interested. She wants to meet again to discuss details with her partner, Willie. When she and Eduardo leave, backup tails them to ID Monica's car. Later, in an effort to ID her, the task force has a uniformed officer conduct a routine traffic stop on the car. The driver is the man who watched the meet in the restaurant. The officer gets IDs on the pair. The man is Gustavo Valencia. And Monica's real name is Rocio Londano. Investigators run the names and discover both are involved with Colombian cartels 
the vicious worldwide leaders of the drug trade. With this information, the C-13 task force opens an official federal conspiracy case and brings in U.S. Customs. From the reports, Customs agent Phil Spinelli confirms Valencia's street name is Willie. Willie had been identified as being at least a distant cousin of Pablo Escobar, who was the head of the major cartel at that time. Escobar runs the Medellin cartel, the most violent gang in the history of Colombian drug trade. He offers bounties on the heads of Colombian police officers, maintaining power by killing whoever crosses him. Since Willie's related to Escobar, the C-13 investigation takes on new urgency. They might now be able to take the investigation all the way to the Colombian kingpin, Lieutenant Mike Garrity. Ideally, in any investigation, you take it from point A to point Z. And that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to get from the lowest level to the highest level. And once we met Willie with his connections, we figured we were right on target during the course of this investigation. While undercover, Epolito is constantly under the threat of death. He can never slip out of character. Tony Romano, the role he is playing, supposedly knows how the ports work, but Epolito doesn't. In order to maintain his disguise, customs agents must give the detective a crash course on international transportation. It was extremely important for, for Richie to be knowledgeable about the ports. You have to remember, what Richie is posing as this is a wise guy, a member of a mafia family. He's also purporting to have connections down at the piers so he can guarantee the safe passage of the narcotics through customs. The only way he can convince Willie and Moniker of this is to have enough knowledge of the inner workings of the pier so when he explains to them how he intends to carry out the caper, it will be believable, it will be true, it will be accurate. Because the cartels are sophisticated enough to run their own background checks, the task force creates a full identity for the fictitious Tony Romano, complete with a long criminal record. Everyone working the case knows how important it is to hide Epolito's true identity. They recall that in February 1985, decorated DEA Special Agent Enrique Camarena was ID'd as law enforcement by the Mexican drug gang he infiltrated. Gang members kidnapped him, tortured him, then stabbed him to death. The C-13 task force wires Epolito to get incriminating conversations on tape. They are all aware that if Epolito is discovered, it could be a death sentence. In previous meetings, no one has patted him down. But that could change. In this type of work, it's very easy to explain them finding a gun on you. I mean, that's part of doing business. You're going to have a gun on you. But it's extremely difficult to try to explain that little wire sticking up tape to your chest. Above all, Epolito has to become his character fully to reduce suspicion. And I had to dress like the wise guys. I had to talk like the wise guys. Uh, I had to have a flashy car. I had to have the jewelry. Soon, Epolito meets Willie. As he moves up the organization ladder, the criminals become more savvy. It gets tougher to fool them. We're talking about people doing a substantial period of time in jail if caught. Therefore, everybody has a sixth sense. Their very existence depends on whether or not they have a sixth sense or an antenna that goes up. And they're there to question uh, Richie. They're there to make some determination. Is he somebody who is reliable, dependable, and can they do business with him? There they are. The task force listens in and covers Epolito. And uh, they're basically your buddies, too. They don't want to see you get hurt. So it's it's good feeling knowing that there are guys there to back up. The task force slowly makes its way toward the heart of the cartel, knowing that at any moment, a single mistake could be deadly. Undercover detective Richard Epolito, posing as a mafioso named Tony Romano, meets with Colombian drug cartel members. He's backed up by other members of the C-13 task force, some of whom act as mafia bodyguards. 
Eppolito tells suspects Monica and Willie that if they can get the cocaine to the New York docks, he can move it past customs into his secure warehouse for distribution. Customs agent Phil Spinelli. That was very appealing to the Colombians because they need somebody to pick up these containers full of narcotics at the piers. After the meeting, undercover agents follow the suspects. They note an interesting aspect of Colombian drug traffickers, according to Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. They took a low-key approach. Colombians did not drive around in uh, Mercedes Benzes and, and Porsches and, and flashy, expensive vehicles. They didn't dress particularly in an expensive way. They didn't particularly wear, exp they didn't wear expensive jewelry, a lot of gold and so forth. They made every effort to remain low-key, and we saw that with, with uh, Monica and Willie. From additional sources, investigators developed more intelligence on the couple was believed that they had loads in the past entrusted to them that had been lost. And therefore, they lost favor, they lost uh, money, and they were obligated to the cartels. When Willie and Monica lost the drugs, the cartels made one thing very clear. Make good on the debt or die. That pressure should help move the task force's case forward. Of course, the people that are indebted to the cartel are looking to get out of debt with the cartel and are willing to take more chances to hopefully make a bigger score to be able to get even. Through Monica and Willie, investigators expand the investigation and pierce the cartel's secret world, according to Detective Eppolito. One of the goals was to uh, establish enough probable cause to get court ordered uh, wiretaps to further enhance the case gather intelligence, uh, basically know what the bad guy's gonna do before they actually do it. Because the couple discussed drug trafficking with Eppolito, investigators have no trouble getting warrants to tap their phones. The task force uses the taps to determine if the cartel believes Eppolito is who he says he is. They felt free talking on the phones. They would discuss a lot of their arrangements, uh, what they had in mind, what they wanted to do, uh, the big mafioso that they met, on tape, Monica and Willie tell their cartel contacts that Tony Romano is a safe bet. We could listen to their calls they were making to Colombia, discussing the meeting they just had with him, and you know we were able to gather insight that you would not be able to, to gather otherwise into what their thinking was. The cartel has taken the bait and is ready for the next step. They send another higher associate to meet with the mafioso. There's also a female that came into the picture named Magola. She was a uh, very attractive uh, Colombian national. Uh, she was the niece of uh, a notorious drug dealer out there who they used to refer to as uh, Ivan the Terrible. He was responsible for the deaths of approximately uh, 19 national police officers. The task force knows Ivan the Terrible specializes in killing cops. Usually in a torture chamber, he had built at his compound in Bogota, Colombia. Eppolito must continue playing his role and needs to convince Magola that he's a mafia wise guy or risk being killed. And he's the perfect cop to do it. He grew up with some, uh, quote, mob people. He knew how they acted. He had the looks, he knew the way to, to act, he knew the way to dress. And you give uh, Richie a little bit of leeway, you give him a script and he could play the role to a T, and he was absolutely excellent in playing his role. Apolito notices one of Magola's associates has a gun Are you nervous? and must decide whether to call for help from backup. He takes the risk and stays in character. He doesn't want to blow the case. Backup knows what to do if anyone gets suspicious of them. It's that possibly somebody is making us. What we would do is, is probably step a little bit further back from the set. So they would think that to a certain extent they are seeing ghosts, where in fact there were no ghosts. In the end, it appears Magola believes Tony Romano can provide a safe route for drug running. 
Slowly, the task force makes its way deeper into the cartel. We were piecemealed individuals. First we met Eduardo, then we met Monica, then we went, met Willie, then it was Margolis. They kept introducing different uh, people. The way it works, those people would report back to the people back in Colombia, and they'd say what's going on. It seems to be going well, but Eppolito can never let down his guard. He is in constant danger. If the cartel suspects anything, they could send assassins and hit Eppolito at any time, not just at a meeting. They could wait, get you at a later time, let you think everything's okay next time you show up. You get one in the back of the head. Feel very uppity, uh, very alert. Uh, it's just uh, natural adrenaline, I guess, that kicks in. Uh, there's a bit of excitement involved. It's challenging. Uh, it's dangerous. Any mistake could mean another murder of a dedicated law enforcement officer. New York investigators try to infiltrate Pablo Escobar's Medellin drug cartel and dismantle it. As the case builds, the C-13 task force puts more resources into it, including an office for undercover detective Richard Eppolito's mafia character. We just had an undercover office in uh, Floral Park, Queens. Then uh, it was wired for both video and uh, audio to document meets and gather evidence. It's the best place for monitored meetings, according to Lieutenant Mike Garrity. We were able to bring the people there. We were able to record the conversations. We were able to videotape uh, every one of these conversations. When Monica and Willie show up to the office for a meeting, they're watched the entire time. FBI Special Agent Mary Setzer acts as Eppolito's receptionist. We met in the office approximately two or three times a month. My responsibilities were to answer the door when the subjects arrived, announce them to the undercover, and then usher them into the office. She's there for protection, but she's also part of the act. Richie frequently tried to ease the tension by making fake phone calls to me from the office during his meetings. He would pick up the telephone and say, make sure that order arrives tomorrow. Get that fax out. It's all done to convince the cartel members the detective is actually Tony Romano. You have to establish credibility with these people. If you say who you are somebody, uh, you have to show them, you have to prove it. So we set up this operation to bring them there and put them at ease. Uh, plus it served as a, a meeting place. It was out of the view of the public. They felt secure, they felt safe. It's a slow process as the task force orchestrates a complex fraud against wary adversaries. Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. These were savvy people, you know, these were people that were involved in drug trafficking for many years in Colombia and elsewhere outside of Colombia in furtherance of the cartel's uh, major worldwide distribution effort. Throughout the whole investigation, we were always concerned that, you know, there would be a slip up, uh, that something uh, inappropriate uh, would be said or perhaps that surveillances would be, would be made uh, that would give the whole thing up. If the cartel ever suspects anything, they would likely kill Eppolito and his informant. On rare days off, Eppolito needs a reason he can't meet Monica and Willie. He tells them he often goes to Atlantic City to tend to the mafia business there. Eventually, Monica and Willie ask to see the Atlantic City operation. Eppolito's got a problem. He has no real business in Atlantic City. The team scrambles to create an elaborate ruse that will trick the drug dealers. Took them all to Atlantic City. That's another credibility thing. They wanted to see where I spent my weekends, where I hung out. So we took them to the casinos. The uh, Jersey State Police were very instrumental on setting up uh, 
uh, the casinos where I could, you know, walk in like I was a big shot. Uh, we could comp them. We got them rooms. Uh, you know, we dined like kings uh, and queens. Backup is all around. The entire undercover operation is carefully scripted, and nothing is left to chance. The task force wants the cartels to see everything they need to see to believe Eppolito is a mafioso. They even send in an undercover officer to act as a mafia captain and ask the informant for a meeting with Eppolito. The informant talked to Richie. Richie walked away, but in clear view of the other participants. The other individual is prearranged, threw his arms around Richie, greeted him, kissed him on both cheeks, and he handed him an envelope with a wad of money. And Richie sent them on his way, walked back to the table, pulled out the wad of money in the envelope, leaped through it, put his back, and Richie complained that he's always working. Even in Atlantic City, he can't catch a break. And these people were totally impressed with this. But the cartel needs more convincing. They send an interrogator to meet with Abolito. His street name is Sammy and he specializes in finding undercover cops. Sammy was somebody, he was a wild card that uh, was introduced to the investigation. He was, uh, you know, an enforcer, somebody that uh, apparently, you know, uh, was capable of, you know, determining whether somebody um, was, uh, you know, a law enforcement officer, obviously. The room is fully wired, and agents watch from an office in the hotel in touch with backup stationed near the room. They must protect Eppolito, but they can't move too soon. You have to make a decision basically uh, in a split second. And if you make the wrong decision in a case like this, let's say to move in, you just, you could blow maybe about a year's worth of investigation. Now, if you move too slow, you could lose an undercover. Sammy starts the interrogation. I didn't pat him at the door to see if he was armed or not, but you know, a lot of these guys are armed and you gotta be careful. And, uh, you know, I had to make sure I came up with the right answers because uh, if we had any inclination that I was uh, either a bad guy looking to rip him off or uh, law enforcement, I mean, God knows what might have happened. Eppolito knows backup is there, but it's still a tense situation. There's always a signal that's uh, set up between you and the backups in case something goes wrong or a code word. Uh, and, you know, you let loose with the signal or the code word, they just take the whole thing down. Several times, Sammy hints that he thinks Eppolito's trying to trick them. We were extremely close there. We could have got in there in a couple of seconds, but those couple of seconds could have meant life or death. Uh, so it is a gut-wrenching uh, situation. As Sammy continues to press Eppolito, agents fear that one wrong answer could destroy the entire investigation, and Detective Eppolito would be killed. Undercover Detective Richard Eppolito faces off against an interrogator from Pablo Escobar's drug cartel a man known only as Sammy. He demands details of Eppolito's past crimes to prove he really is a mafioso. Agents watch the meet, ready to send in backup. At some point during the interrogation process, I, I felt I had to put a stop to it before uh, either I said something that I couldn't back or the informant. And I basically stood up I told him, I says, listen, I says, do you really expect me to tell you everything I've done? Do you expect me to tell you the people I've killed, the people I've done drugs, dealt drugs with? I says, for all I know, you could be a cop, you could be an agent. I says, I told you what I'm going to tell you. you don't want to work the detective me? takes a risk in character as Tony Romano, demanding more respect. I says, here's my hand. Either you feel comfortable with me, or it's a pleasure meeting you, and I'll take my business elsewhere. The tension rises. And he got all upset. He walked off to the side, talking to them. There was some hollering and screaming in Spanish, of course, which I didn't understand. 
Sammy and the others might be planning something violent, but Eppolito can't back down now. You can't show that you're uh, intimidated or afraid of them. I mean, it's the worst thing. You gotta come on uh, just as strong or even stronger than they do at times. Detective Mike Garrity is seconds away, but seconds might be too late. We were getting ready to move in, but Richie handled it excellent. He was able to get out of it. Watch both one one, all units stand down, stand down. Everything's okay. Finally, Sammy decides Eppolito is the real thing. He came back, smiled, shook my hand, and said, we'll be doing business. Once again, the detective has conned the criminals. Customs agent Phil Spinelli. It's all part of being an undercover. It's all part of being able to act calmly under pressure. And Richie, of course, being the pro he is, handled it very well. Before the drug traffickers leave Atlantic City, Sammy decides to test the informant, according to Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. All of the subjects asked uh, the source to, to go to one of their rooms to talk to him. And uh, fortunately, we had an adjacent room uh, and we're able to listen in to, to the conversation. The informant is a civilian, not law enforcement, and might not hold up to the pressure of the interrogation. Agents watch as Sammy tries to get the informant to double-cross Tony Romano. He pushes hard. Got a little heated at times. Uh, the backup teams thought they were going to have to go crash into the door, rescue the informant, and just basically take the case down at that point. It's a big case but not worth a man's life. You have to take calculated risks, and this was another instance where we needed to do that, you know. Uh, can we respond quickly enough? Can we get into the room if this man whips out a gun, you know, or a knife and puts it to our source's throat? The informant refuses to betray the powerful mafioso. He says, his people will kill me quicker than that. He says, I could never do anything to betray him or the family. And when he said that, they, they respected him. And uh, they saw he wasn't going to betray me, so they felt, I guess they felt he had a certain amount of integrity. And uh, he wouldn't be that much of a risk factor for them as well. And uh, they broke open a bottle of champagne in the room, and they celebrated. And another possible crisis averted. It could have been the end of the investigation, or the end, of the, the end of the informant if they had decided to kill him. It seems like endless meetings, but this level of caution is how the cartels grew so powerful. You're dealing with formidable adversaries. I mean, there was a lot of negotiations before we got down to the, um, the fine movements of getting the drugs from Columbia over to here. As the investigation deepens, the next step up the ladder is Hernando Sanchez Aneo, a high-level cartel member. He suggests going beyond a single shipment and opening a new drug pipeline into the U.S., a marriage of the Colombian cartels and the American mafia. We gave them the opportunity to move a product without law, uh, law enforcement interceding from the pier to one of our warehouses. So in effect, what we did, we provided one-stop shopping for this organization, and they loved it. The addition of Hernando means the C-13 task force is moving deeper into Escobar's cartel. It was a feather in our cap to get him involved in this particular thing, and more and more we, went, we knew we were getting closer and closer to the source. With a warrant, investigators tap Hernando's phones. To protect Eppolito, they route calls through a secure Atlantic City phone number to his New York home. During one call, Hernando asks Eppolito to come to Colombia with him to inspect a cocaine shipment. It's too dangerous for Eppolito to go. It would be like walking into the lion's den and the task force would be unable to protect him. But if he backs out, the cartel may grow suspicious and kill him. Undercover detective Richard Eppolito was working to bring down the powerful Medellin drug cartel. 
Hernando Sanchez Eneo wants him to accompany him to Colombia to inspect a cocaine shipment. The detective must get out of the trip. It's too dangerous. His team could not protect him on foreign soil. Thinking quickly, he tells Hernando he can't leave his mob business unattended and hopes he doesn't suspect anything. I mean, one of two things could happen. They could just walk away from you and never have anything to do with you again. Or depending on how far you are into their group or organization, how much you do know, you, I mean, your life could be at risk. Apolito gets a break. Hernando falls for the story. The task force continues to follow the suspects to ID more associates. Investigators watch as Hernando meets with a man identified as Mauro Trujillo, a high-level cartel member who's been wanted by the DEA for narcotics trafficking and money laundering. Agents want to grab him, but they don't want to blow the current investigation, so they wait. As Eppolito gets deeper into the deadly cartel, the danger increases. There's a higher risk factor. Uh, you know, some nights I didn't go home. Uh, if I did go home, I would have to uh, do it in such a way where I made sure I wasn't being followed. Finally, as the new year passes, Eppolito learns the shipment is on its way. But there's a change of plans. Instead of the cocaine, Hernando says they're sending a test load. Nine and a half tons of marijuana. In character is Tony Romano. The detective acts upset at the change. But it's a big load. And would be the evidence they need to bring the operation to a close. It was a heck of a test load. Normally, we hadn't seen anything like that. Test loads were like one or two kilos. See if it gets seized, goes onto the street, and let's see what happens. The task force can't let that amount of drugs on the street. When the load arrives at the New York docks, undercover investigators transport it directly to Eppolito's warehouse. The investigators need to check the container's contents. But there's a seal on its door to ensure no one has opened it. It's a common practice in international shipping. Agents need to find a way to get inside and keep the seal intact. U.S. Customs Agent Phil Spinelli. Uh, what they were able to do is to detach the door without breaking the seal. At first, it looks like a normal shipment of clothing. Stashed behind the shirts, marijuana literally tons of it. We recovered somewhere in the neighborhood of about 272 uh, cartons or crates containing 19,000 pounds of marijuana valued in excess of 21, 22 million dollars. They're definitely dealing with a major cartel. It's not easy to put together nine and a half tons of marijuana. These people had the resources to do all this. These were bad guys, uh, major violators. They, uh, you know, they plagued this country with this stuff. And, uh, you know, they just needed to be taken down and bring a halt to their operation. For prosecution, the C-13 task force needs the suspects to complete the transaction and accept the shipment. Eppolito invites them to the warehouse. And, of course, there was video and, uh, you know, surveillance equipment in place. We uh, had one of the, my so-called one of my workers uh, come with a big bolt cutter and cut the seal on the back of the uh, container. And I handed them the seal. I said, here's a souvenir for you. And they could see that the load was sealed. It wasn't tampered with. It got here in one piece. And I uh, happened to have an Italian switchblade on me, by the way. I cut it open and uh, they examined it and they were happy. So it was the stuff they had sent over, and uh, they also wanted to take some back with them. But Eppolito can't let the drugs hit the street and uses the cartel's unplanned switch from cocaine to marijuana to his advantage. I said, uh, now you screwed me, and, you know, this is basically how it's going to go. You're going to do what I tell you to do. 
I want those 5,000 kilos here. When I get my drugs, then you get your marijuana. The suspects panic. They are desperate to take control of the drugs. Shockingly desperate. Monica actually offered up her baby to me as a form of collateral and good trust. It's a stunning move no one expects. Fear it comes across when you hear stories like that. The reason being is, is that if she's willing to give her child up to this unknown criminal figure, what would she have done to myself or any member of the investigative team if, in fact, she found out we were law enforcement or if, in fact, she found out that Richie, in reality, was an undercover police detective? It sends a couple of chills up your spine. Epolito stands firm. He will not release the marijuana until the cocaine he ordered comes through. The cartel members finally agree and plan to meet later. While C-13 plans arrests, Epolito faces increased pressure from angry cartel members. No, I can't do that. They've got pretty, pretty, uh, you know, heated uh, during these latter meetings because they kept pressuring him to release the drugs, you know, to release some of the marijuana so they can then, they could then sell it. On February 3rd, 1993, more than a year after the investigation began, the arrest plans are finalized. The task force moves in. They start with Willie and Monica at Apolito's office. By this time, the pair suspects nothing. They were bewildered. They didn't know what was going on. Uh, they had guys coming with shotguns, guns out, bulletproof vests on. Then, the man they knew as Tony Romano emerges. You know, I went out there to, uh, to speak to them and try to get them to cooperate. And I told them, I said, you know who I am? I'm, I'm the police. And I guess they felt betrayed and that I had deceived them, which I did in the interest of justice. And uh, Willie actually looked at me with tears in his eyes and he says, uh, how could you do this to me? I said, well, Willie, I says, you come into this country, you bring this stuff, you destroy our people, our youth. I said, I'm a police officer, I'm a detective. He says, I'm here to uphold the law. He says, you broke the law. I said, you people are under arrest. And I was in, I walked out of the room. FBI agents, FBI agents. Within 24 hours, C-13 arrests Hernando and six other co-conspirators. Magola is never found, having fled to Colombia. Eduardo, Monica, Willie, Hernando, Trujillo, and others are each charged with multiple counts of conspiracy to distribute narcotics. FBI Special Agent Mary Setzer. They all pled guilty. However, Mauro Trujillo also known as Restrepo, fled the country and left for Colombia. The FBI is looking for information regarding the whereabouts of Mr. Trujillo. If anybody has that information, they can call the New York office of the FBI at 212-384-1000. More than a year of dangerous undercover work by the agents and officers of the C-13 task force helped cripple a drug cartel many thought was unstoppable.